cover. Okay, that's the preparation done. You're ready to go into the MEG now. They've been using scanners to see what happens when the brain responds to action words like grip or pick. To find out more about their work, I went to the lab in Cambridge where I became the subject of their next experiment. The Cambridge team uses a scanning technology called magnetoencephalography, or MEG. It records magnetic fields produced by electrical activity in the brain. I'm now inside, effectively, or my head is inside a brain imaging machine, which is going to take readings of what my brain is doing while I look at words, and in particular, the sort of words which relate to actions. Um, Rita, are you comfortable in your seat? Hello, yes, I'm very comfortable, thank you. OK, then we are ready to start the experiment. Remember not to move and not to blink too frequently. OK, I'll try. So, there we go. An MEG scanner gives a more complete picture of brain activity than an EEG machine, the device used by Phil Davis. It's a little like a movie compared to a series of snapshots. So when I read these action words, the Cambridge team can see precisely which regions of the brain fire up and in what order. Do we get good responses? I think we're getting uh, something already. Very good. Uh... After a claustrophobic hour inside the scanner, I was more than happy to be released and to find out how brains respond to words. So, can you talk us through what activation do you see in the brain when it's processing language? The question was uh, which brain areas become active and in which order they become active. And what we can see is first the temporal cortex activation and then it moves to the front. And the frontal cortex is, so to speak, the action brain. So, when we hear or read a word that's an action word, the part of the brain in us that will be active if we ourselves were doing that action actually comes into life even though it's on the page. This is indeed the suggestion. It is very similar to this concept of mirror neurons. If we use a word like to pick or to grasp, then this obviously relates to an hand action. There are also words related to foot and leg actions like to kick. And we have shown in previous studies that as you said, immediately after we hear or, or read these words, we see activation in the brain that specifically moves to, uh, to the hand or to the leg area, to those areas that also control our hand movements, that also control our leg movements. Of course, the Cambridge work is just a beginning. Like Phil Davis, they've only looked at single words. But it does suggest that mirror neurons might explain some of the most powerful and mysterious effects of reading a book like Wuthering Heights. Let me in! No! Oh, I'll away! Let me in! As we turn the page to this climactic moment, Emily Bronte's language is not just comprehended, but experienced. Our brains respond to her words as though we were feeling and acting those things ourselves. All I got was my heart. The reader becomes the book, and the book becomes the reader. Of course, we don't have to read books to experience empathy. Our ancestors had for tens of thousands of years no written language. But for them, empathy was an essential survival tool. We're a very social and hence interdependent species. And so the ability to know what's in somebody else's mind gives us some idea of what they're likely to do to us. And that in turn gives us survival benefit. And when our ancestors eventually came up with writing, we found that reading could be more than just a way of transmitting information. It provided a means to muscle up the brain's empathy network. 
When we're reading a novel, what we're doing is entering into the world that's being created for us by the author, a world of the imagination. We might stay within the text or we might elaborate on it, create an imaginative world of our own. And in that rather safe world of the imagination, we can act things out which, if we did them in the real world, might have consequences that we wouldn't like to take. In other words, reading gives us a rehearsal stage as big as the world. The power of reading to create empathy is even being used to heal troubled minds. Get Into Reading was launched in Liverpool and started with the traditional idea of a book group. I think that's the worst motive you've given yet for being the wife of young Linton. But this one is different. The readers here suffer from a range of psychological disorders like depression. When I arrived, the group had got to a key chapter in Wuthering Heights, the one in which Cathy agonises over whether to choose conventional Linton or the brooding Heathcliff. Every Linton on the face of the earth might melt into nothing before I could consent to forsake Heathcliff. Stop there and say, is this sort of state she's in something you'd aspire to? Would you like to be <laughs> feeling what Catherine's feeling for somebody? Definitely. <laughs> yeah, I'd have to feel it all the time and I felt like that. You're, on, you're like happy nearly all, all the time. It can last for weeks, months. It is a beautiful idea in one way when she says, I am here with it. In another way, you get the sense that it could be very, well, you know, dangerous as well, that sense that she's married to someone under false pretenses, really. Mm. I can imagine it then from Linton's point of view. Imagine marrying Catherine, but then knowing that she's in love with somebody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, and Annie will. Did you say Annie will find out? I think deep down she should be with Heathcliff, isn't she? Is mm -hmm. he the one where uh, she's sexually attracted I think to? So, yeah. yes. And the passion. Yeah. Yeah, and that's yeah. who she should go for. <laughs> <laughs> Jane Davis, who founded these reading groups, has seen some remarkable results. People have reported, I felt better within six weeks or eight weeks or something, something like that. So it's, it's quite an intense experience, I think. And it's very liberating. I mean, I think for people who haven't read for a long time or perhaps have never been readers, it's incredibly liberating to suddenly discover this world of strong language that's about things you know about. There's something about the absolute depth of engagement, concentration, that the words enter you, don't they? They are part of you. Once you've got the, the willingness to engage with text, then I think the brain is being asked to do something more than simply absorb, picture, use imagination. Um, it's a very active process. Is there anybody here who has um, found that books have helped them in controlling mood disorders, depression particularly, right. anything like that? Right. Would you mind talking about it? I've had a number of strokes and part of it then has led to, I think it's led to depression and very much, very strong suicidal thoughts. And this time last year when I'd had a stroke, I came back to the group. I found that it's, it's books, books and poems, it's words. It's just fantastic, it does. It sends you into a completely different area. I think for suffer depression, it can be very, very low. And then all well, depression is pushing your feelings down. But if you read something which really touches, well, for me, it all comes out. I've got a marvellous imagination, I used to have. So when you're reading, uh, I used to be actually in there living what the book was saying. Uh, I lost all that. So I am now learning that bit by relearning it, how to, you know, get back into living in the book again. My daughter said to me that reading has done more for me than any antidepressant could do. She's seen the change. These readers don't need to think about the science that explains the way books can retune the mind. They just know that it works for them. We too may not be aware of our neural circuits changing as we read. But they do, whenever we live out the drama of a story inside our heads and think thoughts and feel feelings that originated in another mind. <laughs>